I've been your Upper Noose Riverkeeper for nine years. Oh, this week or next week. Um, and my job is to fight for fishable, swimmable, drinkable water. Uh, Sound Rivers covers about a quarter of the state uh, between the Noose and Tar Pam River Basins. We are a river basin organization, not just the Noose, but all the tributaries, ponds, wetlands, excuse me, everything else that goes into the Noose. So it's a pretty awesome body of water. It really starts above Durham in the Person County area. It was dammed in the 70s to form Falls Lake, which supplies around a half a million people with drinking water throughout the city of Raleigh. It then flows 248 miles east and empties into the Pamlico Sound. It is a very cool body of water during the summer where just below where it comes out of the dam you can walk across it without getting your knees wet where it empties into the Pamlico Sound it is the widest river in the United States and pretty much as soon as the river starts flowing it faces threats um, but the good news is is we are stopping those threats and we are partnering with fantastic organizations such as TLC. And so I'll quit chatting cause I'll chat for forever if I don't stop myself. Um, and I will introduce Eliza who is the farm manager out at the Williams Preserve, um, just on the border of Wake and Johnston County. I first met Eliza a few years ago. She is awesome. She'll never talk, tell, she'll never tell you that. So I will. Uh, the work that she's doing out there is fantastic. And it's a solution to a big problem that we have, which is agriculture, agricultural water pollution. And so I won't steal any of her thunder. I will let her take it off. I will let her give you a background about TLC and then the great work being done out at the Williams, Williamson Preserve. Again, if you have you questions, won't listen to it, go, I'll bring it in there. Throw them in the chat no. box. Appreciate you. Um, Eliza, take it away. Thank you so much, Matthew. Can y'all hear me okay? I've got some very excited neighbors yelling outside, so I apologize for any background <laughs> noise. Um, but welcome, everyone. My name is Eliza Lodley. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Matthew. Um, I was thrilled to start working with Matthew a few years back, and he's definitely been a huge partner, uh, along with the Sound Rivers team, in our work at TLC. So. Um, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes, and if you've got questions, please put them in the chat. As Matthew said, happy to chat with folks afterwards, um, and then my email will be provided at the very end. Um, if you have follow-up questions or concerns, want to learn more about TLC, please reach out. So we're going to get started. I want to first give a big shout out to um, a bunch of the different organizations that we work with, but Sound Rivers is a big one. Um, TLC started um, back in the 1980s, and so we um, have worked with a number of different groups. But the slide that you see here are actually all of our partners just at the Williamson Preserve. So this is on one farm, which is kind of amazing. Um, we work with groups like the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Um, we work with our university systems across the triangle, um, different farmers and community partners, and then of course a bunch of different funders that make our work possible. So um, we're not going to spend too much time on any of these one topics, but I just want to give you kind of a high level overview. I'll give you a little bit about me. Um, we always start all of our TLC presentations with a land acknowledgement. Um, we'll talk about TLC. And then I just want to give you a couple you know, highlights on the farm and then our two farmers that are actually doing the water wise practices out of Williamson. Um, and then we'll end with ways that um, you can get involved in Q&A with me if you're interested. So again, here's a dorky, cheesy picture of me. Um, I have been with TLC for two years now. Um, one of my biggest passions is agroforestry, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, Matthew and I share that. So transitioning our agricultural community to thinking more about raising livestock or crops with trees or other perennial plants. Um, so we'll get into that in a minute, but that's kind of where my scholarship at NC State lies and my interests at TLC. And then the Williamson Preserve is where my home base is located. 
Um, we are a public nature preserve and we're open dawn to dusk seven days a week. So um, if you're excited about this project afterwards, um, we have hiking and mountain biking on the property, which is great. Um, and this is a picture of my farm um, in Durham. I'm also in the Upper Noose. So I grew up in Durham, work in Raleigh, uh, love the Noose. And this uh, piece of land is right next to Falls Lake. So I definitely kind of live and breathe Upper Noose uh, basin kind of typologies with my landscape architecture background and also in my farm background, thinking about uh, water practices and irrigation practices to protect the Eno, to protect the LRB Creek, um, all the way down to where my in-laws are located in New Bern. So really care a lot about this river basin. And my background has been with a number of different nonprofits kind of in the space of agriculture and sustainability. And so starting real quick with the land acknowledgement, for those that are not familiar with this process, we try to always acknowledge um, the indigenous communities on which uh, we work and where we farm. So I'm gonna skip kind of the introduction here for the sake of time, but if folks are not familiar with the Native Land Digital Project, I definitely recommend you checking it out. Um, you can go online to this map and it's nativeland.ca in the top left. And you can type in your farm address or your home address and it will actually give you the native communities um, and indigenous um, tribes that manage and steward different pieces of land, either currently or historically in North Carolina. So Matthew just mentioned the Pamlico Sound. Y'all can see my cursor kind of down here. Um, and the star is where the Williamson Preserve is located. So we directly kind of drain into the Pamlico. Um, and these are the ancestral homelands of the Eno, which is what the Eno River is named after, headwaters of the Noose, uh, the Shikori and the Tuscarora. And so we definitely build upon those legacies. Um, the Triangle Land Conservancy also protects land that are historic in nature. So we work with groups um, like the North Carolina Historic Sites, like Stagville, in Durham and other really important um, cultural landmarks around the triangle. And this is a quick map for those that are interested in the history of TLC and kind of how we interact with groups like the Eno River Association. If you're a history geek like me and you wanna spend more time on this, um, please go to the Eno River Association website and check out the work being done um, on the Fish Dam Road, which is this map you see here, and also the ways that our watersheds kind of fit together in the triangle and support their work. Um, and one final note, and we'll move into the bulk of the presentation. For folks that are interested in kind of anti-racism work in the farm community, um, which I definitely think relates to all the different work we do at TLC, I highly recommend this core food system training. Um, all of our staff are going through this right now with the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. It is free and it's a two day Zoom workshop. So no driving required, it's incredible. Um, and if you're interested in farming and food systems, I, I cannot recommend this more. So I'll send a link to Matthew to share, but highly, highly recommend this. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about TLC and the work that we do. Um, our mission is um, to create healthier and more vibrant, a more vibrant triangle region by safeguarding clean water. So that's our first big ticket item is making sure we have clean water. Um, also working to protect natural habitats, supporting local farms and food, and connecting people with nature. And we do this through land protection and stewardship, which is kind of the role that I play, and then catalyzing community action and collaboration. So if you're not a member of TLC, um, it's really easy to sign up on our website and be a part of our listserv and kind of learn more about this work. But it really did start with clean water. Um, and so these are a couple of ways that we can serve. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we buy farmland outright, which is a fee simple model where TLC buys a piece of land. We put stream buffers on the property or we help protect different streams, um, but we manage it as a staff. There's another um, process, which is called the transfer process, where TLC will buy the property and transfer it to a government agency um, or possibly groups like state parks or things of that nature. Um, so for folks that have been to the Turnip Seed Nature Preserve and others, we love collaborating with um, different government agencies to make those possible. And then the third um, 
process that we use is um, conservation easements. And so for our farmers, this is a really, really popular um, method of protecting your land from um, development while still maintaining ownership and management. So if you're a farmer and you're interested, um, I'd be happy to talk about any of these three things. Before and you this, move on, please, the ice please. cream. Yes. Fantastic. So good. You gotta go get some. And I should have given Maple View a shout out. Thank you, Matthew. So this image is of Maple View Creamery. Um, for those that are not familiar, they have a wonderful ice cream stand and they have an easement with TLC. So some of our big farms in the triangle were greatly appreciative of partnering with them and working closely with our farmers. And this is kind of our region um, for folks that are local. This probably all looks pretty familiar, um, but to orient folks, I live up here in Durham County, which again is the headwaters of the Noose. Um, one of our oldest preserves is Horton Grove, um, which is adjacent to Stagville Historic Site. This is Falls Lake, if you can see that. And here's the Noose River. And so the property we're gonna talk about tonight is this blue icon that's called the Williamson Preserve. Um, and all these other green dots are different um, incredible projects that I'm happy to return to. Um, but we've been around since 1983. We've conserved over 20,000 acres and we have eight different public nature preserves at this point. And so now we're gonna talk about kind of the four ways that we see conservation benefiting our community. And as I mentioned, it really starts with protecting clean drinking water. Um, so with six different land trusts in our region, many of them who are protecting farmlands, um, we've protected 9,244 acres of land on 101 miles of streams. So we're really trying to prioritize properties that are along um, sensitive stream corridors or in our watersheds. Um, and then this image that you see here is the pond at the Williamson Preserve, which actually drains directly into the Moose River. And Matthew has spent so much time out here, which we appreciate, um, but we're constantly kind of trying to make sure that our agricultural practices are protecting these ponds and these streams as we, new, as we bring new and beginning farmers on board. The second uh, benefit that we see to conservation is protecting habitats. Um, so we're doing a lot of different fun projects like um, replanting longleaf pine systems that we're eventually gonna graze with cattle. So kind of bringing in silvopasture models. Um, we're constantly thinking about planting hardwoods and things like that to create wildlife habitat. And then working with groups like Leaf and Limb, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, to bring native trees back into the landscape, whether it's urban or rural. And then connecting people with nature is our third um, priority for conservation. We have so far to date provided 35 miles of trails around the triangle, which if you haven't checked them out, we have somehow managed to keep them all open during COVID. Um, they're getting a lot of love these days, which has been great, but um, please come out to our properties and enjoy hiking and biking when you get a chance. Um, we had 1,574 people attend programs on our properties. And then we have hundreds of visitors a week that come out kind of in a passive way to, to recreate. And then the most exciting benefit to me is obviously the agricultural piece. Um, so our fourth kind of bullet of um, protecting land is really to supporting local farms and food. So the image that you see here is an example of a property that we've protected and is now being managed by a group called UCAN or the Catawba Trail Farm. Um, this is a high intensity vegetable production um, farm in Durham, which is wonderful. So we work with groups like UCAN as much as possible, along with groups like Transplanting Traditions, um, which are engaging farmers from outside of the community and bringing them out to the urban property, which is in Chapel Hill. So um, there's lots of different models that we try to work with around farming. Um, and I'm gonna speak a little bit about the Williamson Preserve, which is kind of a separate model entirely, but um, we're very, very grateful for working with Transplanting Traditions um, and you can in this work. And so now we're gonna jump into the property that I work on um, most days, the Williamson Preserve. And it really started um, actually about 13 years ago, TLC started looking at this property. And I don't know how long ago Matthew was out there, but he's been involved for many years, identifying this piece of land as kind of a key corridor um, in the Marks Creek Basin. 
which is a very vulnerable watershed um, east of Raleigh that flows into the Neuse. And so when TLC was thinking about um, transitioning this property into agriculture, we were thinking about kind of the bubbles that you see here on this Venn diagram. So it's a historic landscape. Um, it had recreational value. There's obviously an incredible amount of habitat and restoration work to be done. But kind of on the right-hand side, we really started focusing um, our efforts out of the property on agricultural production and training. And so the, the quote that you see here in the middle was from a community member um, back in 2018 that really helped the staff think about Williamson being a restorative landscape that connects members of the community to agricultural history and natural resources. Um, and so in, let's see, how many years ago now? The, the property took about 11 years to purchase, which is pretty amazing. Um, but this is an image of the property after TLC purchased the land. Um, it's 405 acres. Um, this aerial shot that you see is kind of the, the farm hub where we have a number of historic buildings. Um, a couple of the structures you see here are historic tobacco barns. Um, we have a number of horse barns and silos on the property. And then we're also part of the Walnut Hill Historic District, um, which is an amazing uh, district throughout kind of the Nightdale Clayton area. And most recently, we've opened up set seven and a half miles of hiking and mountain biking trails. Um, this is a quick image just to give you a sense of some of the structures on the property. Um, many of the barns that I get to work in are uh, over 100 years old, which is amazing. Um, we were cleaning out this barn most recently and found a USDA manual from 1902, <laughs> which is pretty remarkable. So the history of the community and the history of those that have farmed here is very rich um, and goes back many, many generations. And just to give you a little bit of site context for those that are familiar with um, kind of Eastern Wake County, we're surrounded by a number of different projects. So on the right-hand side, you'll see Turnip Seed Nature Preserve, which is right down the road from us. Um, the town of Clayton manages a wonderful piece of property called the River Walk. Um, we also back up to the Noose River Greenway, which is along um, the Mount Sissi Trail. And then we also are adjacent or very close to the Clemens Educational State Forest. Um, so the map that you see here on the left outlined in red is the Williamson Preserve. And then the green parcels that you see are kind of this really beautiful mosaic of other organizations trying to protect the Noose River, which is kind of towards the bottom of your screen, um, this little blue line sneaking along the bottom. So with the expansion of the highway system in East Raleigh, we're seeing a lot of development pressure in this part of Wake and Johnson County. Um, so we really feel like it's more important than ever to bring farmers um, out to this piece of land and demonstrate, you know, water-wise practices. And so um, I won't spend too much time here on the left, but this is our trail map, um, which shows you in the green, the farm itself with a number of different trails. And then here in the pink is the town of Clayton Riverwalk. Um, so this property connects hundreds of acres of public land um, along the Neuse River. And then this is one other image showing kind of the analysis that we've gone through. Um, I'm, a, I'm training right now in, at NC State to be a landscape architect um, with the Triangle Land Conservancy. And so I love geeking out on maps, but this is just one of the images to show you kind of how we're thinking about um, the property. So the orange here are farm fields that are facing generally south or west, and the green are farm fields facing east and north. So we're thinking about water, we're thinking about aspect and slope um, when we're matching farmers across this preserve. And the image on the right, Matthew's been to a couple of times, but this is our newly renovated farm classroom. Um, so we were uh, lucky enough last year to get a big donation to renovate this barn um, with heating and air conditioning and a real bathroom so that we weren't using porta potties anymore, which is great. And we now have um, three TLC offices in the upstairs of this barn. And then in the downstairs, we have a community classroom um, for new and beginning farmers. And then the image on the left is a view of, again, one of our farm drawings, looking at how we're plugging in different farmers across the preserve. 
And we're now going to talk a little bit about how we've gotten people excited about farming on conservation land. Um, it's definitely not for everybody, but um, we found some amazing farmers who are willing to work with volunteers and students um, as they develop their farm businesses. And so some of the benefits that we see um, both to our watershed and to our farmers um, when they work with us and when they come out to the Williamson Preserve is that we are helping them as a land trust to protect water resources, um, soils, forests, and then these diverse fields across the property. Um, we bring volunteers to the farming operations that are willing to support these farm projects. And then my job is really to help make sure that we have grants and market opportunities lined up um, to make this an affordable option for new and beginning farmers. And so one of the exciting projects Matthew has been helping us with, along with um, a number of folks over at Duke University, is working on bringing volunteers out to one of our cattle fields and starting to take soil tests and water samples. Um, so this is an example of where lots of different partners are coming together um, to help Newbold Farms, which is our cattle farmer, to really validate to the public, um, not only that he's rotationally grazing beef, but that his practices are keeping water quality in check, um, making sure that we're not having runoff on the field, and also potentially drawing down a significant amount of carbon um, into his grassland management. So Matthew was out with his two daughters and his son, what was it, a week ago, Matthew? And we try to bring Sound Rivers out whenever we can to kind of make sure that we're um, matching up the farmers with good grazing plans and management plans. So this is a cute image of one of um, our water management practices. We're doing our best to set up different water stations around the property. Um, so we're not watering our cows with troughs or things that could cause you know, muddy pits or erosion issues. Um, so we really work with livestock systems that are recommended um, through Sound Rivers or through NC State to, to mitigate runoff and erosion. Another consideration for farmers out here is that they are working um, kind of with a strict set of regenerative farming practices um, because they are working on a property with a conservation easement. And that's why I say it's not for everybody. So when we bring on new farmers, they have to be willing to kind of think about long-term agreements with the Triangle Land Conservancy. Um, they have to understand that they need to be a community-led organization and also that long-term leases can be quite challenging um, to kind of negotiate. So we've been lucky to find some really wonderful partners. Um, and I'll skip this slide, but here are some cute pals from last year. <laughs> um, and for folks who know new and beginning farmers that may be interested in our work, um, we are partnering this year with NC State through Cooperative Extension um, through their NC Farm Link program. Um, and so this is just a screenshot of their website Folks can go on and kind of type in the number of acres that they need, um, what kind of pasture they're looking for, and it will connect folks with the Williamson Preserve. And so I'm now just gonna give a real quick one minute overview on both of our farmers, and then I'll stop for questions if that works for you, Matthew. Cool, doing all right on time? Couple minutes, sweet. So um, we have two farm partners right now that I wanna share a little bit about for y'all. So the first one is Leaf and Limb. Um, Leaf and Limb is um, managed right now by a guy named Emmanuel Brown, we call him EB. He is the project specialist and director of the program. And so I've listed his email if y'all are interested in getting in touch, but um, Leaf and Limb is traditionally known to many people in Wake County as a tree care company. Um, so you may have seen their trucks driving around the triangle. They actually no longer remove trees, but instead have shifted to tree care and soil care. And so this is a shot of their office in Raleigh where they're now growing as many native trees as they can um, in these raised beds. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're actually gonna be moving hundreds of native trees out to the Williamson Preserve this year um, where they're gonna be starting a volunteer driven tree farm to grow trees for the general public, um, which is amazing. So we've just leased 10 acres to them. They also just got certified as a B Corporation, for those that are familiar. Um, B Corp stands for Benefit Corporation, which means they're thinking about water resources 
um, and other sustainability factors, but they're also doing a number of things for their community. And so a number of practices that Leaf and Lynn is implementing on the farm um, include bringing the benefits of trees to the forefront um, and talking about weather stabilization, um, carbon sequestration, soil health, and of course, water quality. And this is um, a fun image here on the left, and I'll show one more of our native Chickasaw plum stands. I don't know if folks are familiar with our native plum, um, but this is an image of what the plums look like when they're fully fruiting out at the Williamson Preserve. And so these are actually acting as stream buffers for us. Um, so we're talking to folks about the benefit of stream buffers, both for water quality and that they're edible and delicious for humans and cows. And that's my one minute timer. Matthew, if I can have one more minute. Sweet. I'm sorry, all my timer's going off. There we go. Um, and for folks that are interested more in Leaf and Limb and the type of work that they're doing, I highly recommend the Savannah Institute. Um, they have a great kind of overview video on this type of practice. Um, this is kind of a, a method being carried out in the Midwest with the Savannah Institute. Um, but NC State's working really closely with us at, at TLC to kind of bring this practice with leaf and limb to the triangle. And then our second farm partner, and then I'll end here with questions, is Newbold Farms. And so Newbold Farms is um, made up of two people, Jake and Catherine Newbold. They were our very first farmers. Um, they've been in production for five years, and their goal is really to be a leader in the community for producing local food. Um, with sustainability and regenerative practices. And so Jake and Catherine are working really closely with um, us and NC Choices, um, which is a group out of NC State and also Sound Rivers. Um, they've been working with us since November of 2019, and they are part of a USDA beginning farmer and rancher program. Um, so currently they're on about 12 acres, and actually tomorrow we'll be signing a 10-year agreement with them to expand that to 25, which is awesome. So we're hoping to kind of demonstrate how leaf and limb with their tree crops can interact with the cattle um, as we move them around the farm. And so that's kind of where the agroforestry um, and perennial crop piece kind of comes in. Thank you for that excitement, Matthew. Um, and this is just one final quote from Jake. Uh, for him, the reason he got into farming and he's excited about it is to kind of limit tillage which we see on a lot of our large scale farms um, to protect soil health, which has been amazing out at the property, um, to promote biodiversity, and then obviously to graze healthy animals. And so this is just one final image here to kind of show the benefits of rotational adaptive grazing. So on the left hand side, it's a little bit hard to see. There is a small little white fence, um, and this is electric poly wire fencing. So little tiny plastic posts with hot wire, um, keep the cows in these very um, tight paddocks across the preserve. And so on the left-hand side is where the cows were just grazing. And then on the right-hand side is where they were just for a couple of days before they moved off. Um, just to show the benefit of manure um, over time in certain um, restoration projects for us. This is really what we're, we're trying to show. And so I will leave it there, Matthew. And this is another resource for folks that are interested in, in agroforestry is right down the road at NC State. Um, but I'm happy to take questions at this point. Thank you all so much. Yeah, that was awesome. As everyone can see, there's a tremendous amount of work being done out of the preserve. Um, and if you were able to catch an earlier um, talk we gave with my advisor at state, Dr. Lori Unruh Snyder about regenerative farming. Uh, these two talks go very much hand in hand. One was very science focused and here you can see the work being done on the ground with the partners um, of which benefit water quality. So if you got questions, um, feel free to, to throw them in the chat box. I'm going to put up my email, Matthew, here so that folks can have that. Absolutely. Let's see. Thank you all so much for your attention, though. That was fun. Yeah, it'd be, it's going to be awesome in like a year when come back and there's 
six, seven different farmers out there. We've got yep. rotational vegetables. We've got silvo pasture. We got cows. We got chicken tractors. We got all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, Matthew's seen it up, up close and personal, but there's a lot going on. So I'm gonna leave it here, y'all. We are um, welcoming fo folks out during COVID if you'd like to take a tour, um, meet some of our farmers, um, or also participate in a socially distanced work day. Um, so I'll kind of leave that here, but I'll put my um, email here in the chat. And Betsy asked, this is now open to the public. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and it was kind of exciting. We were supposed to open on Earth Day um, <laughs> last year, and that didn't happen because of COVID. So um, it got us a little bit more time to finish up our trails, and we opened this summer. So it's been really cool to see folks using it during COVID. Yeah, the trails are fun. We, uh, as Eliza said, I was out there with my children the other day, walking around, talking about farm planning and whatnot. And they did about a mile, so it's not uh, it's not too strenuous of a hike. Um, so we've got another comment. You mentioned a few water smart practices like alternative troughs for the cows. Which of the farming practices at Williams Preserve will have the biggest and or most important impact on water quality in the noose? That's a great question. Um, and Matthew, feel free to jump in here with me. I was gonna just make a clarification too on our stream buffers, um, which Matthew can expand on, I'm sure. But out at, out at the Williamson Preserve, we're really, really careful about the width of our stream buffers. Um, you know, technically we don't have to have a 300 foot vegetated buffer. <laughs> but I think to answer your question, Catherine, I would say that's one of our, um, it's the cheapest, it's the easiest to manage. And I think it's one of the most effective strategies. Um, it's just to keep highly vegetated corridors along our streams and our ponds. Um, so all of the farmers that we have are very far off of the creeks and streams on the property. Um, but we're really trying to make sure we have water smart practices kind of high up in the landscape um, with those types of cattle waters and things like that. So that by, by the time manure or anything else is washing across the pasture that, you know, it has time to sink in and then it's also hitting these Kind of vegetated buffers. Um, yeah. So the, do you want to add to that? The regulatory requirement for the for streams on the Noose River for our buffer is only 50 feet. Um, so quite 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 a width improvement out there. Yeah. The other two practices, um, two two big ones, keeping the ground covered oh. and improvement in soil health. So soils will do all the work for us when we have high quality soils. And the practices, which Eliza just went over for the last um, 20 or so minutes, they're, they're really soil health practices. And when you build your soil health, you improve your soil organic matter within those soils. Those soils can do a tremendous amount of ecological services, uh, primarily around water filtration. And you know that's why you can have in theory, on a very small plot of pasture, if you're moving your animals enough, you can have a ton of animals on that very small plot because you have built your soil health up to a standard that allows that if we have a heavy rainfall event, that water to sink into your soils. Yeah. And then you have your vegetative cover, which then can, you know, do its photosynthesizing thing, pull that water out, sink that carbon in, and there you go. Healthy, healthy soils equals clean water. Yep. Oh, I'm glad we answered that, Catherine. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think that 50 foot buffers are the norm. I mean, I mentioned that I'm at NC State right now as a landscape architect, and so I'm interfacing a lot with water engineers and um, different folks and it's just, it's just it's something I really feel strongly we have to change 50 feet is just not enough and that's um, just in the noose and that's just uh, in the noose. Yep. yeah that's not it's not a um that's it's um not a standard across the state and it's always been 50 feet um that was the legislative 
compromise that was reached when the new river rules were created. Right. And Matthew, to answer the next question, I'm going to um, change slides here, but let's see. I'm going to go back, if y'all don't mind, to our first map. And um, Rick, thank you for that question. Yeah, Rick, it gets a little in that area. It's, I always have to pull up a map when I'm when I'm in that area to know if I'm in the Deuce or Cape Fear Basin, because that is a little, that's where the little sliver runs in between. Right. Them. All right, y'all, there we go. Um, and Rick, just to answer your question from a TLC perspective, we have two um, directors who manage our farmland protection specifically. They work on all different land protection, but for farm specifically, we have two folks who would be happy to connect you with um, if your friend is interested. And a number of our different farm projects are on farms. So that's something we're very used to, to working with folks who are already in production. Um, but I did just want to highlight these areas on the map that are kind of light green. Um, so not the dots, but kind of the shaded light green hatched areas um, are our priority zones. And so for Hillsborough, we're looking at areas kind of in northern Orange County into Durham, that's within our kind of upper news uh, priority area. So we'd be happy to talk. And then there's a question about what other types of farmers are you trying to get onto the preserve? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And I'm sorry, I can't really see the chat sometimes all on screen sharing. Um, so currently we actually today announced that we're bringing on a third farmer. We have not signed the paperwork yet, but um, we are gonna be working with a small hemp producer on one acre, who's from Nightdale, which is really exciting. Um, so it's a family operation. They're gonna be, we work with all of our farmers on a one year trial period, just to make sure that it feels like a good match to both the farmer and TLC. Um, and if it works out in that first year, then we try to move on to a more long-term agreement. So the hemp farmers number three, um, we've got a RFP out, which Matthew, I'm happy to share with y'all. Um, RFP for folks stands for request for proposal. And so we've kind of sent this proposal out to ask for other farmers to apply. And we've gotten six respondents in the last two weeks. Um, some beekeepers, we've got a cut flower farmer that's interested. Um, we're really looking for a sheep or a goat producer if anybody knows some ruminant folks. Um, we did have a wonderful cattle producer that applied. Uh, we've decided we're only going to stick with one cattle producer for the moment, but we just had a really cool array of folks step forward um, just in the last couple of weeks. So we go through an interview process with the farmers, and then we vet them with an advisory committee, um, which is made up of folks at Wake County. So that's been a really fun process. Are you looking at putting these, this type of model onto other preserves? Um, well, I know you and I would, would like to, but um, <laughs> I guess is, is, is having working lands now a part of the TLC toolbox? Yes, that's a great question. So, and I should make sure I'm being clear. Um, I often slip up on this. So the Williamson Preserve is brand new, um, open to the public as of this summer. And it's a really unique model because we usually do not recruit multiple farmers onto one piece of land. So that's what makes the Williamson Preserve special is that we have a full-time farm manager and we have multiple farmers on one property. So I like to call it farm Sudoku, <laughs> where we're trying to fit farmers in based on their needs, um, but also how they can work together. But we have, TLC has been protecting farmland since the 1980s. So we're very familiar with other management practices and kind of regenerative concepts on properties that we've already protected. It's just usually somebody who's already been farming, like in the case of Maple View, you know, they were well-established farmers that wanted their land protected. Or we're looking at things like transplanting traditions or you can, where we protect the farm and then they actually carry out the management. Um, so it's completely up to the farmer as long as they're within the boundaries of the easement, um, how they manage that. And do they have a specific time that they're allowed to farm on site? Um, 
you know, are you looking to get them out of preserve and onto their own property within a certain time or, or what about farmer turnover? That's a great question, Matthew. I think about that a lot. So we do not call ourselves an incubator farm at this point. And for folks that are unfamiliar with that model, um, usually on incubator farms, there's a wonderful one in Cary, um, which is called Good Hope Farm, where folks are renting pieces of land. And I actually don't know in the case of Good Hope, if anybody does, you're welcome to correct me. Um, but eventually folks graduate off of that land to buy their own property. We're so new at the Williamson Preserve that we're not sure if that model will work for everyone. Um, so at this point, we are open to working with farmers on user agreements. So it's not a lease, but we can do a long-term user agreement if they do want to stay on that property. Um, and the only person that's been kind of eligible for that is Newbold Farms, which is our, our cattle farmer. So everybody else is still in their first one-year trial period. But that's a good question, Matthew, because we're trying to figure out, you know, if folks do kind of outgrow their area, you know, how TLC might support them finding additional affordable land. Y'all just need to buy more property. I know. As I was <laughs> saying, we need like five more of me to, <laughs> to help. But that's really the fun part is, you know, if people outgrow Absolutely. that starter plot, then that's a good sign um, for their business. And if you pay a water utility bill in Raleigh, you're helping buy and preserve these lands. It's through the Raleigh Water Partnership um, yes. that a lot of these programs get funded. And I've had the pleasure of sitting on that board for a few years now. So it's, it's fun to see these projects go through the application process and then produce something really awesome. Yeah. So I don't see any additional chat questions pop up. I um, guess I'll make the last. Um, oh, what are your volunteer opportunities out of Preserve? No, oh, that's my favorite question. Uh, <laughs> So we need volunteers so, so badly at TLC. Um, COVID has been really hard on us in that way because we've had a ton of increased usership, usership of our properties. We see about a thousand people a week at our Brogdon property in Orange County, which is staggering. Um, we don't know how many we're seeing at the Williamson Preserve, but we're getting a trail counter this week. Um, so we're seeing increased usership, but then with COVID, we've not been hosting many volunteer work days. And so it's been a really hard thing for our staff to kind of stay on top of um, a lot of these stewardship activities that require large group work days. So we have just slowly started opening up group work days. Um, they will be distanced and smaller than normal. Um, but if you go to our website, we've got individual group activities um, where a family could come out you know, as a pod or you know, small groups of friends could come out for different activities. And then we do have some, I'm gonna say large group in quotes, um, large group activities where people still would need to be spread out. And so some of those activities would include trail maintenance, um, invasive removal. We're, <laughs> we're cleaning up an old whiskey still on the farm on the 20th. That's gonna be a whole bunch of fun. Um, it just really depends on kind of the season and what the staff is needing at the moment, but we try to make sure that it's fun and, and family friendly. So it'd be a funner cleanup if it were uh, uh, operational still. I know that would be better. <laughs> All right, we got it. We got another question. Um, what types of parameters do you regularly measure to uh, for soil and water health? That's the million dollar question. Yeah. I'm going to let Matthew talk about the water one first, and then I'll cool. do soil, Matthew. Well, so water's at this point way easier cause soil health is very loosely defined um and you can look at all kinds of things but i'll, I'll answer the water one first um usually around agriculture what we're looking at are two things we're looking at nutrient levels uh primarily your nitrogen and phosphorus too much of that in a water body is uh, bad for the water. It becomes eutrophic. Uh, it leads to many other water quality problems, can cause fish kills, can cause algal blooms, low dissolved oxygen. Um, and then the other parameter really around ag that we also look at uh, is bacteria. 
uh, primarily E. coli, which comes from mammals, uh, comes from our poop. And if it's allowed to get in the water, it can make people very sick. It's not just a farm issue. It's a urban issue. It's a sewer issue. Um, during the summer, please check out Swim Guide. You can visit soundrivers.org backslash swim guide. Um, and we do bacteria monitoring during the recreational season. season. But back to soil health. So you can look at a wide range of varieties. Uh, I was lucky enough to finish the soil science. My BS is in environmental management and then uh, did the soil science program at state. And now I'm in the master's of prop science at state. So I'm, I'm, check, I'm trying to check all the boxes. <laughs> um, the uh, soil health. So you can look at all kinds of things from what's going on with in the micro microbial community with West respiration. You can look at soil aggregate stability. You can look at the nutrients within the soil. You can look at how much um, as, uh, soil organic matter you have in your soil. If you're looking at, you know, like your carbon to nitrogen ratio, it's just totally different than water. And mm -hmm. it would be super helpful if we could get the federal government to define soil health. Yep. So that way we can be meeting a set of standards. Um, but science, oil scientists, uh, and I can throw myself in there, can't even agree as to what the best set of measurements are for soil health. So um, out of the preserve, correct me if I'm wrong, the, what's primarily been looked at so far um, is carbon sequestration. So how much carbon can regenerative ag practices sink into agricultural soils? And this can be done all, all around the world. Um, there's lots of really cool research. There's a tremendous amount of uh, carbon that can be sank, sunk, ooh, sunk into, uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go, uh, into agricultural soils. Um, and it's, it's not set in stone how much that is. It fluctuates between climate. It fluctuates between management practices. It also fluctuates. It's not a linear sink. Um, you know, you can sink a carbon on um, degraded pasture land uh, much easier than some other lands, but only lasts for, you know, 10, 15 years before you hit equilibrium. So there, there's a lot in play there. Um, I've just started rambling about soil. So that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I was um, going to say for the lay audience that I consider myself to be a part of when it comes to soil health um, monitoring, I would definitely recommend folks check out if you have Netflix. Um, there's a new movie out, which I have some critiques of, um, but is Kiss the Ground. And my critique is that these practices that we're talking about, especially around agroforestry, um, our ancient practices that kind of how we started the presentation. We've had human civilization in North Carolina for at least 15,000 years. <laughs> and um, a lot of these new slick, you know, carbon farming movies are coming out that we've just discovered that soil carbon is important. Um, and I would argue that indigenous communities um, and BIPOC farmers around the world have been saying that for forever. Um, but it took like the Yale Forestry School to be like, we believe in soil carbon um, for people to be like, oh, okay, let's make some documentaries about it. Um, I've got good news need... on that front. Oh, uh, good. One of my research partners, uh, the Boyds from Mecklenburg County in Virginia, yeah. uh, they started the National Black Farmers Association as well as one for uh, Native Farmers. And Kara was just appointed to the Kiss, Kiss the Ground Board of Directors. So that's Boom. good, very that's good great. thing. Inclusion is obviously very important. Yeah. And it's a shame too, because a lot of these movies that are coming out are really great at explaining the kind of biological and chemical sides of soil health and water health. So Kiss the Ground is an amazing film and it shows a lot of very cool graphics that I found very easy to digest and understand. Um, but we do have a problem with representation kind of in this space. Um, which has been tough. So, and I brought up this slide just to give a shout out to 
the partners that we're working with on the soil health side, along with Sound Rivers, has been Dr. Alan Franzlubers, who's a USDA professor at NC State and who works with the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Um, and he's been helping out with this amazing Duke Bass Connection program. And they, this group that you see here has been doing our soil carbon testing. Um, so again, it's not just me running around, uh, but we're trying to bring in those subject matter experts like Matthew and, and folks at Duke. So thanks to Matthew for educating me as we've gone <laughs> along. <laughs> Alan, uh, Alan is a great person to listen to if y'all ever get the opportunity to hear him speak. Um, he's not boring which is important when giving a presentation on soil respiration. Right. And Matthew, there's one other uh, uh, question here from Karen. So yeah, uh, 2020, tremendous rainfall. Um, the Ritty Creek Field Laboratory right here in Raleigh got over 70 inches of rain over, the, over that 12 month time period which is an insane amount of rain, especially for not having a major hurricane uh, come through the area. And which highlights why we need to handle our water, uh, whether that's stormwater from an urban setting or stormwater from an agricultural setting. I don't think it'll have, well, I don't know um, about, you know, possible impacts later on. Um, we'll see in the summertime. Uh, kind of a kind of a cop out answer there, but um, ho hopefully not, but we just don't know yet. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if you have any questions, you can visit soundrivers.org. And um, Liza threw her email in the chat. Um, and you can always find us on every single social media thing that it ever existed. Um, we're, we're everywhere. And if you live down in the lower part of the Noose River, you have a wonderful river keeper, Katie Hunt. Uh, in Newburn, if you're in Tar Pam, you have Jill Howe, who is wonderful as well. Um, and big shout out to our board members and Corinne and Vale, who are our staff members who are on the call, always making us look and sound better. So appreciate y'all. And with that, I, I think we're good. Let me just. Just um, quickly, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Matt, and um, thank you, Eliza. What a great presentation, really interesting. Um, just a reminder that this is our 40th anniversary. Be watching out for lots of things coming out of Sound Rivers. And our next Tell Me About It Tuesday is the 13th of April, and it'll be Katie Hunt that Matt just mentioned, and Chris Osborne from NC State, and they'll be sleuthing sources on nutrient pollution. So sounds interesting. Um, we hope you'll visit the Williams, it's Williamson Farm, is that correct? Um, in Durham and support the Triangle Land Conservancy and support Sound Rivers. And if you're not a member, join us. We'd like to have you. And I think that's it. And we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>